Good morning and good afternoon to others. Uh, we'd like to welcome uh, you and thank you for attending our webinar today on packaging test methods for validation of sterile barrier materials. The purpose of this webinar will provide quality assurance, design engineers, project engineers, and basically all medical device manufacturers the knowledge to make decisions regarding which tests should be used to validate their sterile barrier system. And here to present today is Wendy Mock, our res resident expert here at Nelson Laboratories. And just a few items uh, before we get right into the webinar. Um, in the future, if you miss one of our webinars you know, and like, or like to refer back to one, you can always find them on our webinars page under the Knowledge Center of our website, uh, usually about a week after the event. Um, that website is www.nelsonlabs.com. Uh, you can also receive notifications and other testing news or updates or, again, all of our webinar updates uh, by coming, becoming a fan on Nelson Labs' uh, fan page on Facebook or following us on Twitter. Uh, just as a little bit of Nelson news, we are now conducting genetic identifications. Uh, Nelson's genetic ID testing equipment is the newest product available in the industry and looks at the 16S ribosomal DNA for bacteria in the D2 region for fungi. Um, just for our, as a way of the webinar, we welcome all of your questions and you can submit them anytime. And Wendy will answer as many as she can during our last 15 minutes of the event. Um, if you have a product specific question or like to contact uh, Wendy about it later, you can um, you know, please write it down and then contact uh, Wendy after the event. Her information will be available. Uh, now let me give you a little bit of background and history about our presenter today. Wendy received her Bachelor of Science degree in Biology from the University of Minnesota. She continued her education by obtaining an associate degree in clinical research. She has been with Nelson Laboratories for six years as the packaging section leader. She's a certified quality auditor and has obtained her RM status with the American Association of Microbiologists. Wendy is actively participating in both the AMI and ASTM working groups. She was also published in the Pharmaceutical Formulation and Quality magazine. We welcome Wendy and the time is now yours. Thanks, Mike. Okay, we have a lot of information to get started on, so let's go through the agenda. We're going to cover standards, a couple of the standards that are related to the packaging testing. We're going to go into sample size, give you some recommendations, followed by some test methods. I'm going to go in depth and take a look at each of the test methods that we offer at the company. And then I'm going to do a brief uh, description on what requires a revalidation. Okay, so here we go. The current standards that regulate the packaging industry right now is the AMI ISO ANSI 11607 Part 1 and 2. And what that focuses on is Part 1 is specific to materials and sterile barriers. And then Part 2 is forming, sealing, and assembly. So specifically, the device manufacturers will focus on Part 1 and then the manufacturers of the raw materials will be involved in part two. The document as it stands was published in 2006 and has been reestablished in 2008 and it is the FDA consensus standard. In conjunction with the 11607, their European version is EN 868. Part one is actually a harmonized document. Um, and the reason that it um, coordinates with is that both documents together represent the packaging. The following sections are then parts 2 through 10. And these are considered vertical standards for specific applications. For example, wrap materials, paper pouches, uh, roll stock, etc. Things like that. Additionally, in the standards, you'll find that it specifically identifies who is responsible for what items. Specifically materials, um, they will provide you with your information 
regarding physical properties such as porosity, flammability, puncture, etc. They can also help you with your assistance in your validation runs and um, they can provide you data on their validation of preformed sterile barrier system seals. So um, using that information is a requirement as a comparison for your seal strength. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, as far as the device manufacturer, your responsibilities include uh, verifying all seals on a form fill seal packaging, um, verifying the final seal on a preformed sterile barrier system, so those pouches that you buy off the shelf and you put your product in and do the final seal, that's your responsibility. Um, any final package performance testing, such as sterilization, distribution testing. And then finally, any preparation and approvals of the final validation report. Obviously, the most appropriate person to establish the exceptions criteria is the device manufacturer. So that responsibility falls on you. OK, some of the important information that came out of the harmonization was the aspect of def definitions. Um, Harmonizing the terminology was a very difficult aspect. For example, the words package, primary package, and final package were all used the same interchangeably. So even though they all sounded the same, they actually got into it and found out that they had different meanings or connotations. So what they did was they came up with these definitions. And sterile barrier system is also known as the primary package. And what it does is it minimizes, I'm sorry, it, it provides the minimum package that will prevent the ingress of microorganisms while allowing aseptic presentation of the product at the point of use. So this is the package that you sterilize. The second definition was protective package. This is also known as a dust cover. And the protective package, it consists of materials designed to prevent damage to that SBS. So it's kind of like a shelf box or a dust cover. And finally, the last definition is packaging system. And the packaging system is constituted with the sterile barrier and the protective packaging. So becoming familiar with these terms will be critical to learning um, how to apply the specific test methods. Okay. In addition to the definitions, the, the standard is divided up into performance characteristics and packaging properties. So some of the things that a device manufacturer will need to um, look at along with the materials manufacturers are changes in temperature range, possibly pressure range, or humidity. And not only are you looking at minimums, but also maximum rates of these changes. Additionally, you want to address any exposure to light, whether it be from sun or UV, the cleanliness of the materials, any bio burden that the material contributes to the device, and then electrostatic conductivity. If you have a device that incorporates um, computer chips or things like that, um, electrostatic conductivity is going to be critical and you don't want to be incorporating a packaging system that um, actually destroys your computer part. When discussing packaging properties, you're required to evaluate several, I, several processes, the microbial barrier, biocompatibility in conjunction with toxicology, any physical and chemical properties, and then it goes back again to the compatibility with the sealing process and how that works in combination with the sterilization and if there's any effect of that on the seals. And then finally, what are your shelf life limitations? And we're going to go into some details regarding several of these aspects. OK, so the most common question that I get regarding packaging validations is sample size. And what you're going to find is that there really isn't an answer on what sample size to use. 
So the standard lists the specific ISO document 2859, and it provides you sampling procedures by inspection from attributes. And how this works is it uses an AQL, or lot by lot sampling scheme. So those are the only document that will assist you in sample size. So that being said, when you look at your sample size, you must ensure that it's big enough that you can detect any scientific significance. But it can't be too big that there's an effect of little scientific significance and it's detected. So using a large sample size but not too large is the key driving factor. Okay, the right sample size for an application depends on several factors, and um, I'm sure each one of you can associate with these. Cost considerations is a significant one. It's not easy to generate all these samples and then just have them discarded because um, package testing is destructive. You've also got administrative concerns. If you have a failure, is it going to affect the design and then how does that incorporate into the complexity? Um, what's your minimum acceptable level for deviations? Um, what's pass and fail? Um, can you identify a confidence level and then what's the variation within that population? And then also you need to take into consideration what the sampling method is. Okay, so those are all good tips on how to justify what your sample size is. Additionally, you need to keep in mind what the results of the data will generate. For example, attribute data is data that represents the absence or presence of characteristics. For example, you're going to have the presence or absence of possibly an organism, or you're going to use a go-no-go -go gauge. Um, dye migration and bubble emission tests are perfect examples of this because they give you a pass-fail result. Variable data, on the other hand, is data that's actually going to give you a qualitative value. Uh, CO, peel, and burst strength are going to give you actual mathematical data. Um, you can put a range on it rather than a pass or fail. So what does Nelson Labs contribute as far as recommended sample sizes? Our recommendation is to test from a minimum of three lots or three batches. In addition, you should test an odd number of samples, 7, 9, 11. You don't want to do even numbers because as the sample size is small, it becomes very difficult to assign acceptance criteria. If you have three, for example, um, or two, it's a lot easier to say um, we'll pass at 50% versus if you have three, okay? Um, in the past, we have seen anywhere from three to 2,700 units. Um, again, I can't stress to you how important it is to verify and justify your sample size. The 27 units was obviously very excessive. Um, it wasn't a recommendation, but um, actually based on AQL levels from the customer. With respect to a whole package test, I'm, um, that's a little different from the other sample sizes. Um, we chose to follow an AOAC disinfectant standard, um, and it indicated to use greater than 60 samples, thereby giving you a 95% confidence interval with your passing results. And we'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about aerosol challenge testing. Okay, let's talk a little bit about worst cases. And worst case can be divided up into two categories. So you have a worst case device and a worst case in the packaging materials. Um, worst case device, you need to establish a rationale around the similarities of the possible devices. For example, um, I like to use catheters. There are multiple sizes of catheters available, but most of them all fit into the same packaging. Um, deciding on what is the worst case would be, could it, is it too heavy, or does it, is it fill the package, that kind of stuff. So you have to evaluate both the worst cases of the device 
and take into consideration the worst case of the material. So performance testing should be conducted on your worst case sterile barrier system. So do you have multiple exposures? Are there different sterilization processes? Things like that. So make sure you keep in mind both of those when you define what your worst case is. Uh, frequently, I've had people send me samples and define their worst case as the sample that's the heaviest in a package and it ends up being that the lightest device is the worst case because it has more room to shift around and therefore it, it rubs against the packaging creating holes and integrity issues that way. Okay, so here's a quick path on our suggestions. We suggest doing a feasibility shipping study first. Um, by performing this at the beginning stages, you're more confident in the fact that your packaging will pass rather than waiting till all your sterilization testing is completed. Then you get into your packaging test and you find out you have a failure and you have to go back to the drawing board. These feasibility studies allow you to get some early data. After the feasibilities and you've worked on your sterilization, you want to start working towards performance and stability testing. In performance, you're going to do three tests from separate categories, including strength, integrity, and microbial barriers. You're going to use their sample sizes, three lots of 11, and then you're going to move into baseline testing. Baseline testing is going to evaluate what your package looks like when you've manufactured it and if it goes straight to the customer. After that, you're going to want to move into accelerated aging. Accelerated aging is going to evaluate the same tests at the end point of your stability. So encompassing all of that, you want to make sure you do a minimum of three points for this entire process. Okay, let's talk about test selection. The ISO document has four pages at the end of an annex that includes suggested test methods to meet their requirements. What's important is to note that you can't just pick one of these standard, or standard tests and that, con that completes your validation. You have to address all three aspects, integrity, microbial barrier, and strength. And then again, you're going to want to do it at baseline, at your accelerated aging, and your real-time point. Okay? And when you decide on what these test methods are, you need to document and justify why you selected them. So let's talk about some method key points that will help you identify why you select the tests that you did. Okay, any test method should be validated in your facility with your equipment that you're using. And this is specific for in-house test methods and any standard test methods that are followed. This also applies to any laboratories. If you subcontract to a facility, you need to ensure that the methods they use to do your testing are validated. Additionally, if you have any variability in your results, you can take a look at those standard methods. Uh, many of them have precision and bias statements, and that can help you decide what the variability is in your validation results. Finally, some of the methods are actually not test, pro they're not test that'll give you results. They're more like processes and they prepare the packaging materials or the product for evaluation. Now, a perfect example of this is accelerated aging. You take the samples, you place them into a chamber, they um, cook for let's say 46 days and then they're removed. There's no results from that. It's, it's the samples were just aged and then it's um, testing that is occurring after the aging that determines whether you're successful or not. Distribution testing is also like that. Okay, let's get into some test methods. Common tests that we've got um, are divided into three categories. We have strength, integrity, and microbial barrier. Um, as far as your strength, you have a couple options. You can do the seal peel, a burst and creep. Um, with integrity, you can do a dye migration, a bubble emission, visual inspection. And then for microbial barrier, you've got the aerosol challenge, an F1608 or F2638. 
And when you go into the ISO document, you will see that each of these is in the appropriate category. This matrix was developed by Nelson Labs to assist people with determining the appropriate tests for their sterilization and material combination. It um, is our recommendations. It's not something that's published by the document. It's just a tool to help you based on our experiences with our um, test samples that we've seen. Um, we can definitely get you a copy of that. It's also available on our website. Okay, so we're going to get into the seal peel test. The seal peel test is regulated by ASTM F88, and it determines the strength of the seal at a specific place on the packages. We recommend that you perform two seals. You want to use the manufacturers and the users. Additionally, it can be used for sending your sealing parameters as part of an IQ test. The way that the test works is you measure a one-inch segment of the package along a seal and then you cut it so there's approximately four inches of material that's available on each side so that it's a little easy to put into the grip. The results are then reported as load at yield or energy to break. This is a photograph of a seal. Um, it's one inch in width and you need to pay attention to how the sample is placed into the grips. It can make a difference in your results. You don't want to put the, the um, stiff material in the top and then for the second sample move it to the bottom because you can get variability. Seal peel is a strength test. A one inch section of seal is cut from a package and pulled apart on a tensile testing machine. The force required to peel is recorded in pound force. This is a graph of a typical peel. The maximum peel is the highest force value. The energy is the area under the curve. The average peel is the average from the middle of the curve. When the curve is relatively flat, the computer can't calculate the average because it is looking for a certain number of peaks and valleys to average. Most samples will peel apart, and the mode of failure is reported as peel. When a sample stretches, it is reported as elongation. When the layers of a material split apart, it is reported as delamination. Okay, so that was a video of an actual seal test. Um, we're going to discuss um, burst and creep now. The burst test is regulated by F2054, um, and it identifies the seal strength of the entire package and the weakened seal. The method for the test involves pressurizing the package until it burst, bursts. The test is some pressure is then preset to a point of the above that burst point. These are actually set up samples that establish the burst position. Then you start, we usually do a couple set up uh, samples and then we move into the actual test. The results um, from this pressure test include a description of where the seal failure occurred and then the actual pressure point that the package popped. This data provides a great idea on where your stress points are located and how they're going to act going through pressure systems. The creep test um, determines the package's ability to hold pressure over extended periods. So when you're doing EO sterilization and vacuums are pulled and things like that, or possibly air shipping, travel over mountains where you change in elevation. Uh, this data will help you identify where these pressures can be issues. The process for the test involves setting the pressure at 80% of the minimum burst test. So you have to perform the burst test first and then determine what that 80% average is in order to move forward with the creep test. Burst is a whole package strength test. Porous packages must be sealed with tape prior to testing to prevent air from escaping through the porous layer, allowing the package to properly pressurize. The package is attached to the tester with a port and inflated until it bursts. The maximum pressure is measured and the technician records the burst location. Burst or failure locations indicate the weakest point on a package. 
Sometimes the seals are so strong that the material breaks before the seal. This is recorded as package failure. Okay, we're going to move into integrity tests. The most common integrity test that uh, device manufacturers perform is the visual inspection. Um, it's regulated by F1886, and it involves both internal and external evaluations of the materials. And what you're looking for is things such as irregularities, such as tears, holes, uh, any foreign materials, um, the integrity of the seal, is it homogenous, incomplete, and then um, if you have regulations for humidity, moisture, or staining. Finally, you can use it to define the dimensional accuracy of the width of the seal. The next test in the integrity is dye migration. Dye migration is regulated by F1929. It will help identify the integrity of a package seal specifically. And the process involves injecting dye into the package then the weight of the solution sits on the seal. Um, we do it for a specific length of time. And then you're looking for evidence of the dye slipping through the seal. Dye migration is a seal integrity test. A dye solution is injected into the center of the sterile barrier system using a needle and a syringe. The weight of the dye is maintained on the seal for 5 to 20 seconds. The sample is rotated and all sides are tested. If any dye leaks through the seal, the side is reported as a failure. The last option for integrity testing that we offer includes a bubble emission test. It is ASTM F2096. This will determine the integrity of the entire package and of the seal. The way that this test works is it involves inflating a package under a surfactant solution. Um, then you are looking for bubbles um, from a single location emerge or emerging through the seal. Um, it's a whole package test versus what the dye migration evaluates, which is just a seal test. Bubble emission is a whole package integrity test. This test detects leaks in both the package and the seals. The sample is submerged in a bubble fluid and inflated to a set pressure. The package is visually examined for bubbles. Any leaks will be seen as a steady stream of bubbles coming from a fixed point. Here is a leak in a seal. This is an example of a hole in a package. Porous materials will exhibit random bubbles emitting from various points. A low test pressure helps to reduce these bubbles. Large labels can pose a problem as all the random bubbles are trapped under the label and will escape in any channels under the label and can appear to be coming from a single point. Well, this is a picture of a common failure that we see with this test. Um, a lot of times people will just buy pouches that are available over the counter and put their device into it. Um, then they'll fold the package and place it inside a box. Um, as you can see, when you fold Tyvek, um, it has the opportunity for the seal to separate from the Tyvek material, which will then produce failures. So it's very important to put the work in up front to make sure that your device fits into the package appropriately rather than trying to fit the package to the device. Okay, we're going to move into our microbial barrier test now. Um, the first test that we're going to discuss is called the microbial ranking test. It is regulated by ASTM F1608 and what it does is it determines a log reduction value of a porous material. Now it's important to recognize that because it's a porous material you're not going to get a hundred percent for the value. Um, uh, it works by 
using organisms and exposing the material to these organisms. And then we evaluate the filtration, the filtration of the organisms through the, the material. The material size is critical. Um, we need to be able to um, test a minimum of 47 millimeters. And after exposing it to the organisms, we blend up these filters and I'll determine the titer values. Uh, they usually are produced as um, values, log reduction values. So they're actual numbers. GM F1608 is a microbial integrity test for porous materials only. Oils and film cannot be tested with this method. Samples smaller than 47 millimeters cannot be tested with this method. Samples with large labels must have an area of at least 47 millimeters of exposed porous material. Samples are cut into 47 millimeter discs and are usually sterilized prior to testing both to incorporate any material changes that occur during sterilization and to reduce extraneous bacteria. At least two samples need to be tested of each material per the standard, but the test unit can accommodate up to four samples per run. Positive and negative controls are run in the other two slots. A nebulizer is used to create an aerosol of the psilocytrophius spores. The box is hooked to a vacuum which draws the spores into the sample material. Any organisms that pass through are collected and enumerated to calculate a log reduction value. Higher log reduction values indicate better barrier performance. Okay, so that was the microbial ranking test. We are now going to talk about the aerosol challenge test. This is an option for devices that are either non-porous or containers or actually um, materials that possibly the label is too large and we can't cut those discs out of. But the purpose of the test is to determine the integrity of the entire package. And the way that it works is the packages are placed into a chamber. The chamber is specifically 36 by 36 inches and this is critical to keep in mind if you decide to use this test because the sample size, if they're larger than can accommodate the chamber size, you actually end up increasing the amount of runs. And that becomes a cost factor, which is always critical. The typical challenge of an aerosol is equivalent to approximately 13.2 years on the shelf life. It's based in part on a five-year shelf life study that was performed at a hospital. And the way that that worked is using um, packs that were wrapped in, um, like wraps, the samples were left at a hospital on a shelf. The weekly environmental monitoring was taken. It used fallout plates and Anderson samplers. At the end of the study, the average counts were determined, and it was converted into a CFU per plate per year. Additionally, in conjunction with the challenge levels, you want to keep um, sight of the particle size. The particle size um, can range between 2 and 3 microns. At the end of the aerosol test, you remove the samples and perform an indicator test. This can be performed using immersion, flush, or media fill. But it is very important that there be contents inside each of these pouts for us to do this um, test on. The aerosol challenge is a microbial integrity test. Samples are loaded into a chamber, carefully spaced to expose as much surface area as possible, and showered with a vortex of aerosolized bacteria. Gauss controls are run to ensure that the bacterial titer in the challenge met the specific minimum requirements. Anderson samplers are used to ensure the mean particle size is within a specified range. After exposure, the samples are removed from the chamber and the outer surfaces of the packaging are disinfected. The packages are opened and the contents are immersed in a sterility growth media. The contents are incubated and checked for growth of the indicator organism. Growth of the 
Philip Petrophius indicates a breach in the integrity of the package. Okay, let's get into transportation tests. Transportation testing is called out in section 6.3.5 where it states the packaging system shall provide adequate protection to the product through the hazards of handling, distribution, and storage. So you want to determine characteristics. There are several um, options for performing these tests. The FDA consensus standard is ASTM D4169. However, they do recognize any of the ISTA procedures. Okay, um, several of the characteristics within the transportation um, tests include climactic stressing. Climactic stressing is the ability of a package to withstand any of the extreme weather conditions. So um, whether your package, um, when it's transported to its user, goes through um, extreme cold or hot and humid, possibly hot and dry. There are several choices in the um, in the ASTM 4332 or in the ISTA 2A. Um, just select the one that's most appropriate and proceed. The handling drop and impact, also known as the drop test, is an evaluation of the package to withstand high impact or deformation from the high impact. The options for these include free fall, rotational, any incline, horizontal, or vertical. And as you go through each of these standards, um, each of these tests as part of the standard, it will identify which is the most appropriate based on things like box size and, and, and items like that. Okay, the stacking load. Um, it is also known as the compression test, and it determines the behavior of materials under crushing loads, such as pallet stacking and things like that. And the way that the weight is determined is it incorporates several factors, such as how high you stack your boxes, whether it's in a truck or on a pallet, um, what is your box size, what is the weight, um, then there's a constant that converts it to weight units, and then finally there's an F factor. And this F factor com, um, accounts for the different effects from compression, and it's based on the assurance level and the material um, that the box is made out of. And um, if you're interested in knowing more about that, I can definitely provide it. Vibration testing is the next aspect to package tests as far as trip chip testing. And there are several options including fixed displacement, variable displacement, and then random. And the purpose is to determine the effects of vibration within the frequency range that your package sees. So it's different for an airplane versus a UPS truck that drives down the road. Um, the random vibration test is actually the closest in simulating the real world conditions but selecting the severity level is very difficult. Okay, uh, we're going to move into stability testing now, and this is regulated using accelerated aging. Accelerated aging is regulated under the standard F1980, um, and the purpose behind it is to demonstrate that the package hasn't been affected by its shelf life. Um, it does not replace real-time aging. Real-time aging is required to be performed in conjunction with accelerated aging, and they should start at exactly the same time point. And determining the um, length of your accelerated aging is actually based on an equation um, and observations by Arrhenius. And the short of it in involves um, that for every 10 degrees above the ambient temperature, the reaction rate doubles. So um, using that formula um, and plugging it into this mathematical equation, um, you're able to determine how many weeks in an accelerated aging chamber is equivalent to a real-time one-year factor. So usually at this point, I throw out some numbers and have everybody do some equations, 
but for this situation, I've done it ahead of time. So an average one-year um, real-time aging is equivalent to 4.6 weeks um, in the chamber at 60 degrees. Um, if you're doing it at 55, it's 6.5, and it goes up as you decrease the temperature. Okay, when you're doing accelerated aging, you're going to have to justify the test conditions and the duration, especially if you move outside of what the FDA is um, used to seeing and usually recommends. So the nominal or ambient temperature that they like to see is 25 degrees with an accelerated aging temperature of 55 degrees. Um, moving away from those, um, they're definitely going to be looking for different justifications on why you feel that those are appropriate and reflective of the environment that you use. Additionally, you're going to want to take a look at your glass transition point, which is TG. Um, if you have any polymers, you're going to want to make sure that you stay between 10 and 15 degrees below that value because as you put them into the temperature they start to melt and can have effects on the interaction between the package and the device itself. Um, additionally, the question that we frequently get asked is, can the aging be done with or without product? And the answer is, it depends on what you're looking for. If you're trying to evaluate the interaction between the product and the packaging, obviously the product needs to be in there. However, if you're just doing a product evaluation, packaging is irrelevant. If you're doing material evaluation, the product is irrelevant. So the, the most frequent um, opportunities that I see includes involving the product. Okay, what is my sample size for accelerated aging? Accelerated aging is a process. It's not an actual test as we discussed earlier. And the sample size is actually driven by what you're going to do with the samples after you're done. So are you going to just do functional tests on the devices, or is there physical packaging tests that need to be performed, things like that. So those values actually drive how many samples are accelerated aged. Okay, we're going to wrap it up here with a little bit on revalidation. Um, when do you revalidate? Uh, very similar to the sterilization methods, um, if you make any changes to the sterile barrier systems, any process equipment, the device, if you relocate anything, uh, those are the things that you need to look at as far as whether you're required to revalidate. Um, you want to be careful not to overlook minor changes because when they're all combined, they can create a major change. So evaluating the change and performing risk assessments will usually drive whether you're required to do a revalidation or not. Okay, um, I think that wraps it up for the packaging tests. Um, we're going to move into questions now. Okay. Um, I have a lot of questions. Um, wow. Let's start at the top. Um, okay, why odd numbers for sampling was one of the questions posed. Um, the reason that we use odd numbers is um, when the sample sizes get to be very low numbers, um, the odd number will allow you the tiebreaker. So um, it's like, for example, when we had the sample size of three, um, if I had a two and I had a pass and a fail, the third option would have allowed me that tiebreaker. And then based on the acceptance criteria, that will then drive whether you pass or fail. Okay? Um, okay. How is the FDA feeling about using medical grade paper instead of Tyvek for medical device packaging intended for EO sterilization? Um, how the FDA feels about it? Um, I think it depends upon how the validation is driven. You can use paper for the sterilization. Um, the validation for the packaging is exactly the same. It just follows through demonstrating integrity, 
microbial barrier, et cetera. And as long as the EO and the paper are compatible, you should be fine. Okay. The next question, is it common to perform transportation for aging samples as well, or is it better to perform them separately? Um, it depends on the purpose of the test, but the majority of the consensus is that you should evaluate um, the climactic stressing separately. Um, you can incorporate transportation in aging. It uh, depends on the outlook that you're trying to examine. Um, most samples, when they're manufactured, do go through a transportation process and can be stored at a facility, so that would evaluate that situation. Okay, does separate aging data on material justify not doing aging on the overall packaging system? Okay. Um, I don't believe that that is true. The, if, even though you've done, let's say, aging data on Tyvek and aging data on the film and then possibly a device, the combination of them could have a separate effect that individually they would not have. So the best option is to do it as a combined system rather than doing it individually. Okay, the next question is from where did the one pound force seal strength minimum requirement come from? This is typically used in the industry. This is correct. Um, again, the one pound has been um, evaluated and a lot of people see um, issues with their seals if you go below that value, um, but actually finding it written down somewhere is not going, you're not going to find it. What is the defect size limit of the bubble emission test? Um, our validated defect size is 0 .005 inches. It depends on the person doing the test, um, what they validate. Okay. Okay, the next section that I found is, do you recommend the dye migration test over the bubble test or vice versa? Um, my personal preference is the bubble test because it's like you get more for your money. It's going to be a whole package test. As far as the sensitivity between the two, they are equivalent at our facility. We have validated them both to the same sensitivity level. So it just feels like you get more for the money when you are doing a bubble test. Oh, here's a really good question. What is an FDA consensus standard? The FDA consensus standard is a list that's provided by the FDA. And what it is is it's kind of like the path of least resistance. If you um, follow the standards that they've approved, um, you will not have as many questions or things like that when you submit your samples for re or your report for review. Okay. Is is the 3A considered shipping within the continent continent as in S is the 1A? Um, I actually don't have my standards for the ship testing here right now, so I can't answer that one. That would be more appropriate if uh, I spoke one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. How do you choose the appropriate Q10 factor? Okay. The Q10 factor 
um, is developed by evaluating all the materials that you use. Um, the conservative value, um, as is in the standards, is two. Um, in the six years that I've been with the company, I've actually only seen one other company change that value from two. It was um, an engineering study that they were evaluating the materials of a product rather than the packaged material. Okay. Is one microbial challenge test more sensible or sensitive for finding defects than the other? Um, with the respect to the microbial challenge, the as far as finding defects, it depends on the defect that you're looking for. Um, the F1608 is going to be more designed around the log reduction value through the materials. So identifying homogeneity is going to be one of the factors that it identifies. But with the microbial aerosol challenge, it's going to be more of like whole. So, um, it's not going to, that's pretty much what it's going to be looking for. Okay. What is the recommended sample size for transportation testing? Um, it depends. Again, going back to the original question of combining accelerated aging with transportation testing, if you choose to go that route, um, obviously your sample size will be significantly increased. However, if you choose to do a study with just transportation, the minimum recommended sample size is three boxes. Okay. Um, a lot of questions about getting copies of the presentation and we will be able to provide that to you. What is the newest version of ISO 11607? The newest version right now is the 2010. Um, it currently is in um, collaboration between the Europe Union and uh, the US. So it will be um, updated in the near future. What is the standard terminology for a dual tray packaging? Um, uh, pretty much we just refer to that as a double tray system. And what would be appropriate modifications to the test plan for dual tray or dual pouch systems? So uh, that brings up a really good question. Um, identifying where your sterile label uh, is in regards to the dual system will determine how you proceed for your validation. So if your label is on the exterior of a pouch, a dual pouch system or tray, then the validation requirements themselves would be on that exterior tray and pouch. But that doesn't mean that you need to neglect the interior pouch. You might want to take a look at maybe a minimum of a uh, strength or integrity test for that tray or pouch because it's serving a purpose and you want to provide data surrounding that purpose. Okay. How does Nelson verify the sensitivity of each of your packaging integrity methods? So the way the validations work, um, we identify uh, thicknesses of wires and we actually um, seal those into the packages. This is common, everybody can do this. Um, and then using our test method, we try to determine what is most frequently picked up in the test. So, and then tying that back to the specific um, thickness of the wire helps us determine the sensitivity of the test. Can we use manufacturer's data of microbial challenge to weigh this test in a package performance validation? Absolutely, um, provided that the data that you use is representative of your product. Um, frequently, I refer um, customers that do gamma sterilization to find out this data from the manufacturer. 
a little more difficult when you're referring to ethylene oxide sterilization because the parameters are so different depending on density and things like that. So um, trying to replicate exactly what the manufacturer has used is difficult. But absolutely, if you can get that and find it representative, you can use that. OK. Um, where do we find the chart on the website? We can definitely provide that easily. Um, it's in the packaging section of our website. So um, if you're interested in actually having it delivered directly, um, just give me a call and I can email it directly to you. Um, what about the 40-hour wait time for the COPL test according to FADA? Um, the purpose behind the 40-hour preconditioning period is to, if you're doing um, the test in Florida and then you, for some reason, have to do it someplace else, the data that you generate from the test is actually comparable because the samples have been preconditioned to the exact same specification. Um, there's a lot of conversations out there right now about possibly removing or significantly reducing that 40-hour preconditioning time. So um, as the ASTM committees continue to move forward on that, I do believe that you will see a significant reduction there. Okay. What would you recommend for continuous seal testing for a foil foil bag? So um, this, I would still um, do the seal peel test for a continuous seal. It's just you wouldn't have anything to compare it to other than itself. So establishing an acceptance criteria is where you would start. If the oh, what size or number of defects is clinically important? Um, that's a difficult question because it can depend upon. Um, how many samples you're making for that clinical trial. Um, obviously, if it's a made-to-order, um, you're going to want to have some data on your package before you get to that point. Um, usually, doing like the feasibility study assists significantly when you're moving towards clinical. Um, Question, next question, bubble or dye testing for a foil foil bag. Um, specifically since the dye is a visual observation, I would recommend doing a bubble test. Um, if you do do the dye and there's partial failures, you won't be able to identify that at that point. But for a bubble test, you can definitely see any failures, whether they're through the actual package itself or through the seal. Okay, um, I have a ton more questions, but I'm running out of time, so um, I believe that they'll be addressed on, in another manner. Unfortunately, we're out of time right now. Uh, again, we'd like to thank you for attending our webinar, um, and we'd like to thank Wendy for sharing her expertise with us. Our next webinar um, will be on particulates, uh, their role in the medical device industry. And that will be on June 30th, 2011. Again, we'd like to thank you for attending today, and we hope that you have a great day.